Welcome to Nostalgic Medicine, a look back at the history of medicine and healthcare. Today's video is on the history of antibiotics. Without antibiotics, a simple wound infection could kill you. The acts of childbirth would be a much more dangerous process and you wouldn't even be able to have any type of surgery without the risk of a deadly infection. Antibiotics only came into widespread use after the Second World War, but they are arguably the most important group of drugs in all of medicine, saving millions of lives every single year. Many of you might have heard about Alexander Fleming and his mould, which we'll get into later in this video, but the history of antibiotics is much more than this single story. The first thing that I need to stress to you is that an antibiotic is an agent that can target bacteria and they are completely useless against viruses. Even though people only discovered bacteria during the mid 19th century, doctors in the past still were able to recognise how things like wound or skin infections looks like and made many attempts to treat them before they could kill you. Many different substances were applied to infected tissue by ancient doctors but one substance you'll be most surprised to hear was commonly used was mould and references to mouldy bread being used can be found as early as two and a half thousand years ago in places like China, Egypt and Greece. So the doctors of these civilizations just so happened to be on the right track with treating infections over two millennia before Fleming was. Even though it was clear that there must have been something in this mouldy bread that was responsible for fighting infections most medical historians reckon that this treatment probably didn't work that well because the concentration of the antibiotic substance in this mould would have been way too low to have any meaningful effect on the infection. So despite the very best efforts of past doctors, bacterial infections were one of the leading causes of death for most of history with devastating epidemics of bacteria like tuberculosis, bubonic plague and cholera being a regular occurrence. But we finally started to see some sign of progress in the mid 19th century thanks to the work of people like Pasteur, Koch and Lister as the germ theory of disease was discovered and doctors began to realise the importance of preventing bacterial infections which would usher in the search for the first ever antibiotic. The modern era of antibiotic therapy started in the first decade of the 1900s thanks to the work of the German doctor Paul Ehrlich. Before working on antibiotics, he'd spent many years researching dyes that could stain human cells which would allow them to be viewed through a microscope. But Ehrlich noticed something. Some of these dyes were able to stain bacterial cells but had no effect whatsoever on human cells. Since this staining was a chemical reaction, this led him to hypothesise that he might be able to find something that could actually kill bacteria without harming the body. He called this hypothetical substance a magic bullet and began to refocus his research into finding one. He started screening the properties of hundreds of dyes and testing them against infected animals. Ehrlich eventually found success when he began using chemical compounds that contained the element arsenic and started specifically testing the effects on the bacteria responsible for syphilis, which is a sexually transmitted infection that he could think of as being the HIV AIDS of its time due to the devastating long-term effects that it leads to. After years of testing, he found his magic bullet in 1907 with a substance called arsphenamine which was also known as compound 606 as it was the sixth compound in the sixth series of tests using arsenic compounds. From animal testing, the clinical trials moved on to humans with syphilis and it was found to be incredibly effective at reducing its symptoms. The company behind Paul Ehrlich's team would go on to patent arsphenamine, 
and they gave it the trade name Salvason, which would instantly become the top selling drug in Europe and America. Now even though Salvason was only effective against syphilis and no other bacterial infections, it still marks its place in history as the first ever antibiotic. But it was also by no means a perfect drug for syphilis, as it had several side effects such as liver damage, which shouldn't really surprise you considering that it does contain arsenic. But what Ehrlich's discovery did do was make other doctors believe that it might be possible to find antibiotic treatments for all kinds of bacterial infections. For the next breakthrough in antibiotic therapy, we remain in Germany but go forward 25 years into the future. The largest dye manufacturer in the country at the time were IG Farben and taking inspiration from Paul Ehrlich's previous success with dyes, the company believed that they can find an even more effective antibiotic from the thousands of dyes that they produced. IG Farben set up a team led by Dr. Gerard Domak, and just like how Salverson was discovered, his team spent years screening thousands of different dyes, until in 1931, when they discovered that a compound was successful in treating a streptococcus infection in a mouse. This compound would go on to be given the patent name Prontosil. Domac would find that his six-year-old daughter would be the perfect human test subject for Prontosil, as she coincidentally just developed a streptococcal infection from a needle wound. She would have surely died from it, as the infection was rapidly spreading from her hand, but she made a remarkable recovery after her father treated her with Prontosil. The drug would eventually go on to gain worldwide fame, after it was used to treat the strep throat of the son of the then American President Franklin D. Roosevelt. But strangely, even though Prontosil seemed to treat a wide range of bacterial infections in humans very well, it didn't seem to do anything when tested in vitro on bacteria in a lab. This strange observation led researchers to discover that Prontosil was actually a prodrug, which was metabolized in the liver to its active form sulfonilamide. And as luck would have it, sulfonilamide had actually already been discovered by a PhD student's feces around the same time that Salverson was developed. But since it didn't have a patent to it, anyone could use it. This resulted in a sulfur craze, where chemists began to create hundreds of new chemicals based around the sulfonilamide compound, and by the beginning of World War II, there were hundreds of effective sulfur drugs in the market. It was effective for things like meningitis, pneumonia, postpartum fever, and was probably responsible for saving the lives of thousands of soldiers in the front line during World War II. So Gerard Domac's discovery of the effectiveness of sulfur drugs is without a doubt one of the most significant discoveries ever in medicine, and the sulfonamide compound has since been modified even further to create drugs for other uses and it's now used to treat conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and inflammatory diseases. Sulfur drugs still do get used today for some infectious diseases, but they have since been overshadowed by more effective antibiotics like penicillin, the discovery of which is a very famous story and marks the start of a golden age of antibiotic therapy. Like I mentioned earlier in this video, mouldy bread had already been used for thousands of years to treat infections. And once people started to accept germ theory in the late 1800s, this was corroborated by several scientists who found that bacterial growth could be inhibited by fungi. But no one really did anything to expand on this discovery, that is until Alexander Fleming came along. Fleming was a Scottish physician who already had a high reputation in the medical community for his previous research. 
and in 1928, he began conducting research on Staphylococcus bacteria, investigating how they grow. In August of that year, he left some petri dishes of Staph aureus in his lab and went on vacation. But when he came back from vacation, one of the plates had its lid open and had been contaminated with a green looking mould. And in the area around the mould, there was no growth of Staph aureus, whereas the bacteria grew normally further away from it. A light bulb lit up in Fleming's head, so he took his mould and successfully tested its effects on several other bacterial species. He realised that there must have been some specific chemical that the mould was producing to kill these bacteria. He named this chemical penicillin, after the species of fungi that was responsible for this mould, and he decided that he needed to find a way to make this chemical in a large enough quantity, so that he can actually treat humans. But when he initially presented and published his findings, he gained very little attention as his peers saw no real way to make any real practical use of this tiny mould. Fleming searched for years to find anyone who was willing to try and mass produce penicillin and it was only over a decade later that his search was finally complete. In Oxford University in 1940, a team of researchers saw some potential in Fleming's findings. They were led by Howard Florey, a pharmacologist, and Ernst Chain, a biochemist. With the team's combined knowledge of many scientific disciplines, they were firstly able to isolate penicillin from the mould, and then optimise the mass production of penicillin from an initial yield of less than 1% to eventually over 80%. Large-scale clinical trials were unsurprisingly successful and penicillin was approved for widespread use, at first only for soldiers during World War II, but then for the general public in 1945, after which it overtook Salvacen as the number one drug in all of medicine. Fleming, Florey and Chain would share a Nobel Prize that same year. So you might be thinking, why was Fleming's discovery of penicillin more significant than the other antibiotics before him? Well, penicillin came from another living organism, where salvacin and sulfonamides came from synthetic substances. And since scientists realised that many other microorganisms naturally produce substances to kill their competitors, this led to a golden age in antibiotics where we were able to discover and mass-produce several new classes of antibiotics, which mostly originated from microbes. The most common source of these new antibiotics were from the soil, after a Russian microbiologist figured out that most of the bacteria that causes disease in humans don't survive in the soil, meaning that many natural soil bacteria must be producing potentially useful antibiotics. Between 1940 to 1970, about a dozen new classes of antibiotics were discovered from the soil, all inhibiting different parts of the bacteria's cell machinery, with some of these classes being effective in treating diseases that penicillin was ineffective against, such as tuberculosis or many gram-negative bacterial infections. By this time, you wouldn't have been too crazy to think that medicine had finally won the war against bacteria. But life always finds a way. Even before penicillin was discovered, Antibiotic resistance had already been seen in bacteria tested in lab conditions. And as the public use of antibiotics ramped up, resistance was becoming more and more common, so doctors found that one by one, these valuable drugs were quickly becoming redundant. During the golden age of antibiotic discovery, it wasn't that big of an issue, 
as we were discovering new classes of antibiotics faster than bacteria could develop resistant mutations. But from after the 70s, the discovery of new classes massively dried out, and we've only discovered about three since then. Many techniques to overcome the emerging antibiotic resistance have been tried, such as multiple drug regimens, only prescribing antibiotics when absolutely necessary, and making slight chemical changes to existing antibiotics, which the mutated bacteria might no longer be able to evade. But we are definitely losing this arms race to bacteria, and at the current rate that resistance is developing, the number of deaths from drug-resistant bacteria will increase from where it currently is, at 700,000 a year worldwide, to over 10 million a year by 2050. And based on the global disaster that we've seen by a single coronavirus that we have no effective treatment for, you can imagine that this coming disaster will be much worse than this. But who knows? With a more cautious use of antibiotics in medicine, new research on other sources of natural bacteria to possibly discover new drug classes, as well as potential new alternatives to antibiotics such as virus-based bacteriophage therapy, there is a small chance that we can avoid descending back into a new dark age of medicine. <laughs>